Yeah, yeah. I just have a physician. I have one physician uh, who sees me in St. Pete, so who's, who who does noon appointments, so it works out well. So or twelve thirty, so works out well. So, uh, so I, I carried on. I carried on a meeting until until I was able to join here. So, and then uh, then I'll get get right back to Tampa after. <laughs> before before rush hour traffic, which is great. So great, 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 great. yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. So, welcome everyone to um, Grand Rounds, uh, Roy Benke Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. This is our third edition of the 2023-2024 academic year. Uh, really sterling two first talks by Dr. Cardet and doc by Dr. Sherbuck last week. We have another fantastic talk today. Now, um, due to the very unique, innovative nature of this material, we are not, not going to be able to provide continuing medical education this week. But I can tell you this material is well worth watching and enjoying. Uh, and today's speaker is Dr. Haryam Yadav, uh, and he shares a dual appointment both in the Department of, um, of Digestive Diseases and Nutrition, uh, that's GI, in our internal medicine department, and as well in the Department of Neurosurgery and Brain Repair with Dr. Harry Van Loveren, uh, who is our interim chair, as everyone knows. Uh, Dr. Yadav, uh, got his uh, PhD in biochemistry in India, and then did a uh, postdoctoral fellowship uh, work at NIH. Uh, you know, his accomplishments are too numerous to state. Uh, we would take the whole hour to talk about his over 155 uh, public, uh, peer-reviewed publications, grant funding over 15 million with continuous funding for at least 12 years, as well as numerous international invited uh, lectures that he's been asked to give. Really, truly blessed to have Dr. Yada, Yadav in our department. And today's talk is, as I was telling him, one of the most fascinating uh, titles and enjoyable titles I've seen in Grand Rounds history and really defines uh, MI as not just myocardial infarction, but also microbiome imbalance. So the title is Microbiome Imbalance in the Aging Gut-Brain Access Strategies for Reversal. So with that, I will Turn it over to Dr. Yadav uh, for a, another exciting talk at Grand Rounds. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Yadav, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Lejana. It's, it's really a pleasure to uh, to be here, and thanks a lot for your uh, wonderful uh, introduction about me. And I think so you described uh, me better than I could uh, have described for myself. So it's really a uh, pleasure to be to be here. Um, so hello everyone, and thanks a lot for uh, for joining um, uh, me too on on this uh, on this grand rounds. Um, uh, we will be talking here uh, more about the gut microbiome, which really um, uh, related to the what the lunch time we are going for. So tiny bugs living in our gut, and uh, they they will be giggling with our food. What we will be maybe eating uh, during our lunch time. So let's talk about about that. And uh, my the my title of my talk is microbiome imbalance in the aging gut brain axis and the strategies uh, for the reversal. How we can reverse the abnormality in the microbiome, which comes with the aging. Uh, these are my disclosures here. Um, before I deep dive more onto the uh, our talk further, I would like to share some of the fun facts about uh, microbiome, gut brain axis, and really the what the science is. And we will take a little bit context of um, uh, general saying that oh, I have a gut feeling, which our grandma used to even say that. But we will kind of try to understand is what is the science behind it, why we used to call the, why, why our grandma used to call the I have a gut feeling, and we also uh, talk about that, but what is science behind it? Um, as now the emerging science of the microbiome is coming and the more and more evidences are coming, showing that is actually our body has 10 times more microbial cells than our own cells. So uh, in other way, actually in the ecological system or ecological definition, actually we are more microbial than the human. If roughly we talk about is around two kilogram of our body weight is built by the microbial mass. Uh, although the mass is smaller than the human cells, but the, the numbers are bigger because the um, microbial cells are several times smaller than the human cells. So they can even account more into the numbers, but their mass might be uh, significantly uh, low. 
However, um, uh, when we talk about, okay, this is the numbers we talk about, but what this means is about by the functions. Can these microbes living in and around our body can also regulate the anything in our, our, our body functions? Uh, so human, D, uh, human Genome Project has taught us is, uh, although human DNA is pretty long, but really the 98% of, of the human DNA is almost the inactive DNA or the junk DNA, you call normally call that, right? Only 2% of the DNA is expressed um, uh, in the form of proteins. So uh, roughly around 23 to 24,000 uh, genes uh, are expressed in the form of proteins. And now if we talk about the proteins, proteins are the fun fundamental functional unit of our body. So think about any function you account in our from our cellular level to the transcription level to transport level for the any enzyme level uh, to any function like even muscle fibers, neuronal fibers, everything is really done by the protein. Although the carbohydrates and fats are also other macromolecules or major ingredients of our cells or our, our body, but they really assist the proteins to function the uh, to 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 function the physiological outcomes or the cellular outcomes or the molecular outcomes. So that shows that the protein is the fundamental unit. Now you can see that the our genome or human DNA or human genome is actually makes only 23 to 24,000 proteins, whereas the microbi microbiome living in or around our body actually makes the more than 300,000 proteins. Now you, this decision I leave on you. You can um, you can decide like who controls whom, who makes the more functional unit in our, our our body, and who can control whom. The another aspect of looking on the microbiome is if you look uh, if you take the any drop of blood and measure the metabolites circulating in the blood, actually around sixty percent of these metabolites are coming from the gut. And think about blood feeds to each and every cell type. And this is how these metabolites also reach. So although the microbes are not going in our blood circulation, but they send their metabolites. And these metabolites can influence each and every cell type in our body, including the brain cells. Now, when we talk about the brain cells, actually, uh, now the emerging evidence also shows that is our gut has as many as neurons as our brain has. Um, so that's the reason why our grandma used to say I have a gut feeling because the, normally the feelings or any neuronal function, any decision or any behavioral function supposed to be driving from the brain. But why we used to call the brain feeling is because really does the second brain living in our, uh, our body is a gut actually influence many, many um, our brain functions uh, uh, to, be, to be performed by. Some of the classical example in terms of the biochemistry, you see that uh, around 90% of the serotonin, uh, which is a very, very uh, important uh, neurotransmitters, uh, as well as the 50% dopa dopamine is actually uh, made into the gut. Now, these uh, these neurotransmitters are so potent, if you just change their labels, you can really change the whole personality of a person in few minutes or few hours. So that's that's how you can uh, you can see that where they are majorly made in there. And not only actually they are majorly made in their way, actually they depends on how much they will be made because uh, based on the microbiome activities, because the raw materials or the substrate which are used to synthesize these um, neurotransmitters are actually supplied by the microbiome. So the microbiome also indirectly actually controls the production of these, uh, uh, these neurotransmitters. On the same time, the microbiome can also produce a certain uh, uh, neurotransmitters, including like GABA, glutamine, tryptophan, and many other, other kind of the uh, neurotransmitters, which can also come on the microbiome. So this is kind of the very, um, uh, these are the new facts coming out in the science, how the microbiome can influence our gut and brain, and as well as the uh, other parts of the body too. Um, let me just introduce you what we are doing currently uh, in here in the microbiome center. Um, we really running the very translational research program, which really we call that the, it translate the, our science from plate to the pupil, as well as 
we learn the certain uh, questions uh, into the pupil, which we cannot answer the mechanistically. We really bring that those questions back to the plate and, and use the cutting edge technology, including the organoids, C elegans, and the transgenic mouse models to address th those questions. And I will try to show you some of the examples how we have been uh, doing this one through the showing some of the data, what, what we have done uh, so far. So, my as in as I put the in my talk, the we are looking on the microbiome abnormalities in the aging and and looking on the aging related conditions like the gut brain axis abnormalities. So when we are talking about the aging, as we know that really it's coming uh, like a tsunami. Um, the reason is we are really just the eleven to twelve years away from where uh, the the older people will be more than the younger people in the United States. And this is the graph you can see here. This is really kind of almost make, making kind of X kind of uh, structure there. And what this me means is like Florida is being one of the uh, uh, state uh, which house the largest uh, older population. And this is keep increasing in here. And the aging is actually bringing the lot of uh, health burden on the healthcare system, which we can talk into this uh, uh, this uh, uh, in this slide saying that is aging itself is a strongest risk factor for many many chronic uh, diseases which comes into the uh, older adults. Whether whether we talk about the heart diseases, whether we talk about cancer, stroke, or any any other diabetes, kidney diseases, Alzheimer, they all come with the aging. So although uh, when we say about the aging, although the aging is not a disease. However, um, uh, it, it is a one of the major risk factor of most of the diseases which comes into the later part of the life. As I said, that because aging is not a disease, so that for that reason, there, there, is, there are no FDA approved drugs for anti-aging uh, properties. However, being the uh, aging as a major risk factor, we still do not understand why aging brings or invites these uh, many uh, health conditions, as well as we also don't understand is how we can prevent or treat these aging related conditions. Normally what happens is in the, our clinical practice is really we are treating a single disease. So cardiologists normally focus on the heart failures, the endocrinologists more for diabetes, nephrologists for kidney, um, as well as the same thing for the neurology and the other aspects is, this applies for. But the aging is, is a collective uh, risk factor for all these uh, different conditions comes in. So that's how the one of the concept is can be um, can be some way intervene the aging which can actually reduce these comorbidities with, which comes with, with, with the aging. So one of the concept has been proposed few years back uh, in the NIH is called the zero science hypothesis. Really, this zero science hypothesis is all about not treating the particular disease. However, focusing on the treating or intervening the aging biology, because as I said, the aging is not a disease. Aging is a biological process because everyone age doesn't matter whether uh, uh, whether someone will get sick or not. But the aging is a fact of of our our life. Uh, and but the aging brings a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, problems during the late part of the life. So the zero science hypothesis really focus on is rather than treating single single uh, diseases, can we target the biology of aging, and and then that way we can actually reduce this number of comorbidities, which can enhance the health span into the uh, people, so that so the overall idea is still we are living in this world. We should be living healthy, and as as our time comes, our health declines immediately, and we, we basically leave the uh, leave the world. Um, and when we talk about the aging biology, actually, aging biology have some fundamental uh, biological mechanisms which are involved in the aging. Now, when we talk about the aging, actually, we always think about about the older people. 
But the reality is the aging actually starts from the day we become exist into this, this universe. So even the, from the day of fertilization, actually there's these all these mechanisms actually kicks in into our embryonic development, then the after we are born versus we grown up, and we, then, then we start getting older. All these fundamental mechanisms are, are involved in, in, in one way or another way. So for example, the stem cell regeneration, metabolism, proteostasis, micromolecular damage, stress, and epigenetic and inflammation. These are the fundamental mechanisms are needed for our development and survival, but on the same time in early life, they are working perfectly. But at the at, in the later part of the life, the abnormalities comes into these metabolic pathways. So uh, when we talk about in the aging, actually one of the fundamental uh, phenomena appears is the inf inflammation or the chronic inflammation. And that is also called in current uh, uh, terminology is the inflammation. So the people who has the higher inflammation and then when, when they are getting older, actually they will develop more aging related comorbidities. And, and that's kind of the one of the uh, major risk factor of aging related conditions in there. And this is one of the example where um, the ERIC study, which is the atherosclerosis research uh, intervention study, actually shows that they have done the 20-year the follow-up into the people, so from the midlife to the late, um, late life or the older life. What they have seen is the people who has the higher inflammation during their midlife, actually they develop a lot more uh, cognitive decline. So uh, here you can see here, as we grow the older, our, our uh, body becomes more inflamed. And, and, and it's not just the inflammation is in the blood circulation. Actually, this inflammation also reached to the different uh, organs, including the brain. So you can see here in the left side, the brain for, of the young person, then the brain of the um, mid-age mid person versus the brain of a older person. Actually, this inflammation progressively increases with the, as we get older. Uh, so for that reason, the, the first question comes is where this inflammation comes when we get we are getting older. Um, now, when we talk about the source of these inflammation, there are majorly two sources of the inflammation are um, described in the whole whole biological uh, phenomenon here. Uh, one is leaky gut. Uh, what happens is, is as we grow, as we grow older, the microbiome abnormalities as, as actually increases, and that is uh, called as a gut dysbiosis. When the gut dysbiosis appears, it increases the inflammation and the uh, gut permeability. When the gut permeability increases, normally gut only absorbs the nutrients or the ingredients which are needed for our body and does not allow everything to go into the blood. Like think about what we eat, it doesn't appear everything in the blood. So, but when this gut permeability increases, this non-space uh, leakage start happening where the inflammatory signals from the microbial ingredients as well as the food ingredients start coming in, as well as some of, even some of the microbes can also leak out which actually create the chronic inflammation because during the aging, this uh, uh, this gut permeability increase actually establishes as a kind of permanent or chronic condition, and that promotes the age-related conditions. There is a, another source of the inflammation in our body is defined is the senescence. So as we go, grow older, we also accumulate the more uh, half-dead cells. They are called the senescent cells or the zombie cells. And these senescent cells are also actually start secreting some of the uh, uh, inflammatory um, cytokines, which also impact their neighboring cells and, and the immune cells, which kind of goes on there. So we have been also working on the senescence uh, related uh, mechanism, how they impact the uh, muscles, mitochondrial functions, which we recently published in the JCI. But in today's talk, we will mainly focus on the leaky gut uh, and how this leaky gut actually can can uh, uh, can promote the age-related conditions. So, as I said, as we grow older, our microbiome becomes different, um, different as well as the abnormal. Uh, so you can see here, uh, this is a kind of one of the pilot data we have created from our clinical cohort study uh, and our, uh, our very uh, intelligent and brilliant um, uh, postdoc fellow, Dipthra uh, Chaudhary is working on this project. So uh, what, what we have seen is the younger people has the different microbiome than the older people or other way. 
Um, and the, one of the phenomena what we have seen is the older people microbiome is less diverse. So this uh, Senan index shows the diversity. And actually the diversity is the main definition of the how the microbiome uh, looks like, whether the microbiome is healthy or unhealthy. So the less the diverse microbiome is, the unhealthy, the more unhealthy it is. So which is showing that is as we grow older, somehow the microbiome diversity goes down in our uh, in our microbiome, and that's how the microbiome becomes uh, uh, unhealthy. The question comes here is, does this microbiome is becoming unhealthy is because the, we are getting older, or this, this abnormal microbiome also contributes in any way of the age-related uh, dysfunctionalities too? So we wanted to show is, whether the other dysfunctionalities also coming uh, into the aging, like for example, when we were talking about the uh, uh, leaky gut uh, or the inflammation. So we can ma also measure the leaky gut by putting the one type of the dye called the FITC dextrin into the oral gavage of the mouse. Normally what happens is this dye normally doesn't go into the blood. So, so the fluor fluorescent dye, it doesn't, uh, the, it doesn't induce the more in, uh, fluorescent into the blood, but when there is a more leaky gut, it comes more into the blood. So you can give through the oral route and you can measure into the blood and see if there is a more dye or fluorescence is coming into the uh, blood, that means there is a more leakiness is happening. And you can see here, the older mouse shows the higher leaky gut as compared to the young. And this is also linked with the higher inflammation uh, is coming into the uh, older mouse as compared to the uh, young mouse. And this inflammation is not only restricted into the gut, actually it also appears into the more into the blood because the serum interleukin-6 and TNFL5 inflammation markers are also increased there. Uh, and our, our uh, postdoc fellow Siddharth Misra is actually working on this, this project. Um, so, then we ask the another question is, okay, we saw that the older people has a different microbiome. Older mouse models also has the higher leaky gut and higher inflammation. Is that the older microbiome is the cause of increasing this leaky gut? So, so to prove that what we have done is we took the a microbiome from young and old mouse and then transplanted that microbiome to young mouse. These are age and gender matched, uh, matched uh, young mouse. So both are the same age. And we have done the, some of the assays to measure the leaky gut, inflammation, and the other uh, gene expression assays. Um, and also what we tried to do is we wanted to make it like more humanized to make uh, how we will measure that into the humans because this fluorescent dye is not uh, compatible to do, do into the human humans as, as well as the safe. So what we also used another concept is as the leaky gut comes in these LPS, which is one of the microbiome ingredients and which is highly pro-inflammatory, comes into the portal vein from the gut leakage and then goes to the uh, uh, liver. And what the liver does is liver try to neutralize this uh, LPS by, by producing a protein called the LBP and this lipopolysaccharide binding protein. And these all the LPS, LBP, and its receptor called the CD14 all started increasing into the blood. So if there is a leaky gut, these markers will increase also into the blood. And you can measure these markers through ELISA into the human samples too. So, so that was the reason why we make it more on the humanized way. Now you can see it here, the mouse which received actually the old microbiome uh, they increase the higher gut permeability as well as the higher other markers of the leaky gut LBP and CD14. What it is showing is even if you put this old microbiome in the young mouse, actually they start showing the similar phenotype what the old mouse were showing. And, and, and this is also linked with the increased leaky gut is also linked with the increased inflammation into the gut. So you can see here all these inflammatory markers were increased in the gut as well as into the blood circulation. So this really kind of recapitulates the phenomena. You didn't change anything. You just changed the microbiome from old to the young mouse and young mouse starts showing the similar phenomena what the, what the older mouse were showing. Then we also wanted to look on, uh, on the, does these effects are just restricted into the gut or into the blood, or did they also go into the other parts, including the brain? 
So we wanted to look on the what the brain functions and, and the brain uh, uh, physiology is changed when we just transplanted the microbiome into the uh, gut. So you can see also here is the old microbiome recipient mouse also has the increased inflammation into the brain too. And they also has the many, many behavioral uh, uh, phenotypes which comes with the aging as, as, as the older people are more susceptible for having the cognitive impairment. And you can see there is a higher cognitive impairment. The, the older people are also susceptible for having the higher depression and anxiety. And you can see all these measures were also increased into the mouse which received the old uh, microbiome. So only changing the microbiome, you can see all these effects are coming. And when we look into the more closely, what is happening into the brain, actually the microglia activation, which is the, uh, which is the brain immune system cells are also activated. There is a more A beta accumulation, which is the part, which is the kind of the characteristics of uh, Alzheimer pathology are also increased there. And the neurogenesis, which is important for keeping our brain healthy at, as well as to keep our brain regenerating, was significantly decreased. So all these phenotypes uh, are coming, even we are not touching the brain anything. We are just making the changes into the gut. And these, these effects are actually reaching to the brain just by transplanting the old microbiome into the young mouse. Then we started kind of uh, asking the lot more in-depth question is, okay, this old microbiome is inducing the leaky gut and inflammation in both gut and brain um, and promoting the early aging, but how it is doing, how, what, what this old microbiome is doing in the gut to induce the leaky gut there. So we wanted to uh, look on the more molecular mechanisms and what we did is we performed a gene expression array to find out what these uh, genes are changed when we transplant the old microbiome in the, into the younger. So you can see here the mostly when, when we, we look on onto the old microbiome versus the young microbiome transplanted uh, mouse intestine, um, the, the inflammatory markers are increased. But on the same time, the gut barrier markers were significantly decreased. The, some of the gut barrier markers are called the mucin uh, as well as the uh, jonulin. They were significantly decreased. When we ran the, because there are multiple of the genes are there, we wanted to make sure we unbiased way we can uh, find the right target there. So we ran the random forest analysis. In this random forest analysis, what we found is the mucin genes were most significantly impacted by this uh, microbiome transplantation there. And, and what, so, so I just want to give you an overview what the mucin means in our gut. Um, actually, the mucin is a kind of a glassy layer which is between the microbiome and the, our uh, intestinal epithelial cells. So what happens is when this mucus layer is intact, um, the microbes are away from our, our cells. But when this, mic this, when this mucin layer is broken or, or kind of become thin, then these microbes start touching our cells. And when our, touch, our cells sense this, this microbial touch, then they actually become more inflammatory. They start making the gaps, and then that's how the leaky gut actually appears there. And then they, because of these compromised intestinal barriers, and that's how these uh, these leakiness will allow these inflammatory markers to uh, inflammatory components to come in and activate the immune system. And that's how this whole chronic inflammation will come in there. So then we wanted to look in the more depth of the what this aging microbiome or older microbiome is doing for these uh, mucin or as well as the mucin producing cells in the intestine. So uh, the interesting part here is you can see here that in the older, uh, in, into the younger uh, mouse recipient, there are more uh, goblet cells, whereas in the older mouse uh, uh, recipients, I'm sorry, this is the mis mislabeling uh, in here, um, but the older mouse uh, uh, recipient actually has the less goblet cells. And so these goblet cells are the one responsible for producing the more, uh, more mucin. And you can see here, the number of goblet cells is decreased and even the mucin in the feces is also decreased uh, there. We can measure the, uh, measure the um, mucin into the human um, stools too. And, and this was the similar way what the donor mouse, which the old versus young mouse, are also has the similar uh, uh, less number of the goblet cells and less uh, amount of the mucin is coming to the stool. So this is the another example you can see here, just transplanting the microbiome from the old gut to the young gut is again showing the very similar physiology what was into the older, older gut there. 
We also further ask is how can the old microbiome reduce the go goblet cells and the mucin? Um, and, and then we wanted to kind of look on is the more functions of the microbiome, what the functions of microbiome is doing to reduce these goblet cells as well as the mucin. When we talk about the microbiome functions, what happens is microbes produces many metabolites. And these metabolites are the one which actually act on our cells. So we wanted to look on the what kind of the micro, microbiome metabolites are presenting into the old versus young gut. And you can see here, actually, the old gut has very different kind of metabolites than the uh, young gut. While one, one important thing I want to emphasize here is these mouse are eating exactly the same diet, drinking the same water, living in the same facility, still has the very distinct kind of the uh, uh, metabolites are appearing appearing into their uh, gut environment. So this is kind of very interesting. We, we definitely say that the microbiome can be changed by the, uh, by the diet, but on the same time, actually the microbiome can also be changed by the physiology what we, uh, what we have in our, our body too. So this is the classical example why which the diet is not changing much as compared to the, our body actually changes more, more for that. Now we wanted to look on the which metabolite are actually more significantly impacted into the old versus young gut. So when we did the, again the random forest analysis because these are all multi-omics and the large omics analysis, so we, 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 we get several thousands of the uh, hits in there. So we wanted to select the which is most significant one. And you can see here the butyrate and taurine were significantly down-regulated into the older gut. Red dots means the down-regulation there. And so we, we thought like the in the older gut, uh, we found that the old, older gut, the butyrate levels were significantly down-regulated uh, by the older microbiome. So we, we, we asked the, another question is why butyrate um, uh, is produced less by the old microbiome? So what, what, what normally happens into the butyrate synthesis is there are some classical genetic or genes or proteins are involved. For, uh, for doing the enzymatic reaction to convert the some substrate for the butyrate. And some of these uh, classical um, proteins are called the buck and the bud. So butyrate kinase and butyrate transaminase. These are the classical enzymes are required to convert the some substrate for the formation of the butyrate. So we wanted to measure the expression of those particular proteins in the microbiome of old versus young mouse. And you can see here, these protein, uh, these expression of these uh, genes were significantly da down regulated into the uh, old microbiome as compared to the young microbiome. And when we, we transplant this microbiome to the young uh, mouse too, actually this phenomena is also transferred from the old gut to the young gut too. So you can see here the old FMT mouse also has the reduced uh, expression of uh, these uh, both of the genes. Showing that is somehow the older microbiome start having the less butyrate synthesis, uh, synthesizing bacteria, and this uh, this is this is uh, deficiency of the this butyrate producing bacteria lead to reduced butyrate production, and reduced butyrate production lead to reduced mucin uh, formation or reduced goblet cells, and that increases the more gut permeability there too. We also wanted to look on the further mechanism, what, how the butyrate is actually controlling this leaky gut and inflammation. One of the common mechanisms what happens in the butyrate works in our, our body is, so when the butyrate or the starch and fatty acid are produced by the microbiome, they actually uh, binds to a receptor on our cells called the free fatty acid receptor too. And when they, when they activate this free fatty acid receptor, that's how the many beneficial effects, including increased mucin production, actually comes through. So we wanted to see is what is the impact of the aging uh, and the microbiome have on this FFAR2 expression in both gut and brain. And you can see here in the older mouse gut as well as in older mouse brain, the expression of this FFAR2 and FFAR3 is decreased along with the decrease its substrate of the sorch and fatty acid like butyrate there. And what we did is then we, 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 we asked the another question is what happens if we knock down this particular FFAR2 protein into the intestine and then see whether that can recapitulate the same phenomena what we have seen when we transplant the old microbiome to the uh, young. And can the, this deletion of this only one gene, only in one cell type, uh, in the gut, 
can increase this whole early aging phenomena, what we are seeing into the microbiome transplantation studies. And you can see here the intestinal specific FFAR2 knockout mice also show the higher gut permeability as well as the decreased, decreased mucin levels there too. And this also actually corresponds to the increased uh, inflammation in the gut and in, increased inflammation into the brain. And you can see here, this is exactly the same thing here. We are not doing the, any microbiome interventions. We are doing just the FFAR2 deletion and this, all the early uh, aging phenomena actually started coming. We also have characterized this uh, knockout mice for many uh, other uh, uh, physiological functions like including cognitive decline, inflammation in the gut and brain as you can see here, as well as the Alzheimer pathology, all actually is increased into this FFAR2 intestine specific knockout mice. So again, this is happening into the intestine and this, this really this effect is transmitted back to the uh, brain too. Be, so, so one of the limitation is like you can say that, okay, wh what happens if you give the butyrate to the pupil? Can you reverse that? Yes, you can do that. But the problem is butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. So as soon as you give through the oral route, it gets digested and emulsified and absorbed and broken down into the something else um, in the lactate, pyruvate and other, other, other substrates. So for that reason, it's really not, not uh, feasible in, into, into the clinical practices there. So for that reason, what we, we, we approached in the other way is can we still activate the FFAR2 by using some other natural compounds there? So we have run the uh, a screen of the more than 144,000 compounds to predict the which actually uh, compounds can can activate this uh, particular uh, particular uh, receptor of the butyrate and we found the 15 compounds we validated them into the cell lines as well as in C elegans and to, into the mouse and we found one of the compound called the fanchol and this actually fanchol, when we give this to the mouse, it reduces the Alzheimer and cognitive decline um, uh, pathology. Uh, and, and, and these are the multiple mechanisms uh, happens there where the A beta accumulation, amyloid accumulation, tau accumulation goes down, senescence also goes down, and the inflammation in the brain also goes down. And, and this, is, this is what the activation through the FFAR2. Um, the, the good news here is actually this fanchol as a compound presents into a natural edible uh, uh, plant called the basil. So the basil has the natural fanchol. If someone eat the basil, actually can have this uh, sup supplement of the fanchol coming in. So uh, we, have, uh, we have been working for licensing this technology for a company called uh, Biomage Health, and which is bringing this uh, uh, basil extract in the form of the dietary supplement called the Fancognia, and this will be coming into the uh, coming for the people. So this is the one of the example how we really translate the our science from the plate to the people. Uh, uh, this is the one one example what we want to say. So till now I have been talking about all the okay. This is great looks into the mouse. But does this leaky gut or the other phenomena what we are seeing also has the relevance to the humans too? As we know, the actually the leaky gut impacts in multiple uh, uh, multiple organs, and can we also um, reverse this leaky gut if if this is appearing with the different different kind of phenomena uh, as we are growing older? And in this, this cartoon is also shows like how this really can induce not only the leaky gut, actually it can induce the leaky syndrome because when the leakiness come into the blood, it also in, increases the leakiness in the blood vessels, blood brain barriers, and every all, all other organs are also impacted there. So you will we'll show a little bit on, on that aspect. So to, to investigate the relevance of this leaky gut and this microbiome leaky gut and inflammation, we are taking the advantage of several clinical studies what we are running on uh, with, uh, in our group. One of the study is called the Microbiome Aging of Gut and Brain Consortia. And this study is recently funded by the uh, Florida Department of Health. We are, uh, these are the five universities uh, in the Florida are participating and recruiting these, uh, these participants. Now we are, uh, so we also have the, some funding uh, acquired from the uh, NIA uh, in, the, in the NIH also, and we are adding actually more sites, which I will uh, talk in the next slide too. We are also got selected and the part of uh, uh, the another big consortia called the HeartShare. 
Um, and, and this is also bringing the samples from these Northwestern Mayo Clinic, UPenn, UC Davis, Wake Forest, and the uh, Mass General uh, for us. And we are the core facility for, for this uh, NIH funded heart share program, um, which is bringing the 1000 uh, um, samples from the heart failure patients. We are also doing the, another clinical trial of, again, focus on the leaky gut and the inflammation and the microbiome uh, by the metformin in the heart failure patients. It's, that's also funded by the, uh, by the uh, NHLBI, uh, no, sorry, NIA for the EO1, uh, uh, EO1 program called the MATFAF trial. Um, as I said, that the, our uh, MIA GB consortium is also uh, growing. Uh, we have submitted uh, last month uh, another one grant to kind of expand that to for the 11 sites uh, to develop a biorepository. To so really, our goal is to make the largest biorepository for the microbiome and aging uh, area, and that's uh, that's what we are doing through this uh, new program called the MABB, which is basically based on this uh, MIA GB. We are also expanding, and I'm writing right now the one of the U54 grant, which is due on the November, uh, where we are uh, bringing the highly diverse uh, cohort from by including the 17 different universities to really make, as I said, the largest consortia and most diverse consortia of the aging population, and which will be characterizing the microbiome, leaky gut, and the brain health uh, uh, issues there too. These are the other, uh, using all these cohort, what we are also developing is uh, using the uh, artificial intelligence, we want to really see is if the microbiome can be used as a biomarker for both young and age, so aging uh, aspect, as well as for the uh, cognitive health aspect. So far we have the success is if someone gives us the date, uh, just a blind sample, we can really tell is whether this sample is coming from a young person or it's coming from the old person. When it's coming from the old person, we can also say, is, does this person has the dementia or this person has the cognitive function? We have like up to 80% of the confidence on our predictability. We are trying to improve uh, more and more, and we, we are working this with the computer science department in the USF for, uh, for developing these uh, AI-based technology. Now coming back is how the leaky gut is relevant to the older or uh, older humans. So as I said, we are working on this heart failure, uh, specific type of heart failure uh, population through the heart share as well as the MATFAP program. Um, what we have seen is, uh, again, if you see these um, heart failure patients, uh, these are again, all the older people are uh, 65 plus uh, years old. You can see here the HEF patients has the, actually the low diverse microbiome. Again, I was saying that in earlier, the less the diversity the microbiome has, the but the higher the abnormalities it has. And these are the other microbiome signatures, which I don't want to kind of go in the more detail, but you can see here the older people with the heart failure uh, uh, condition has the very different microbiome as compared to their healthy controls there too. Now, when we talk about the leaky gut, you can see here the LBP uh, labels were significantly high into the heart failure patients, as well as the systemic inflammation markers, the CRP and interleukin-6 are also significantly high, which we have seen similarly into the older mouse too. Now, when we talk about the butyrate labels in their stools, you can see here the butyrate labels are also significantly down into the older uh, heart failure patients as well as the fecal mucin is also significantly down into the older uh, people. So this is also showing the same mechanism actually is conserved into the mouse as well as in humans, which related to the aging and the microbiome abnormalities there. So, and showing that the older microbiome is producing less, uh, less butyrate uh, because it's less diverse and it's uh, less butyrate is leading to have the less mucin and when this mucin layers are weak or the less or the thin or broken, it actually induces more leaky gut, which is an indicator of the LBP, as well as the more systemic, uh, uh, systemic inflammation indicated by the CRP and IL-6 level. So this is exactly the conjured mechanism is presenting into the human as well as in the mouse. So I hope up to this point, I have shown you the enough evidences where we can conclude that the old microbiome induces the leaky gut and inflammation because it has the less capacity to produce the butyrate and butyrate actually uh, suppression in the butyrate lead to the suppression on the FFAR2 and FFAR3 signaling, which reduces the less number of the goblet cells and low mucin, 
and that allow the leakage of the inflammatory markers. When this inflammation comes through the gut, uh, from the gut permeability or leaky gut, actually it reaches to the brain and makes the brain also inflamed. And when the in inflammation appears into the brain again and again, actually it increases the higher uh, cognitive decline, higher depression, higher anxiety. In overall, the more early aging kind of symptoms you can see. So that's the reason many people, when they are, when they are even in the uh, 50s, they look like the 70s or, uh, or, or uh, 60s or 70s. They not only looks like they feel like a 60s or, or 70s or 80s. Uh, and these are the some of the things actually can impact the brand. We also have uh, recently published a very uh, nice story by saying that is we always talk about what microbiome produces, but microbiome also works like a garbage cleaner because we eat a lot of garbage by our food and as well as our body also pours a lot of garbage as well as toxins or the end product in our gut. Someone need to be cleaning that one. So this is this was a kind of a unique angle what we have uh, first time uh, reported by the, uh, of the function of the microbiome saying that is if the certain bacteria are not there because to to clean up this garbage then that garbage will keep coming back and back to our our body and again create the leaky gut and this is the mechanism I don't want to kind of dwell in the more uh, more detail there but one of the thing what we found is when we eat the more animal food uh, based diet as well as the when we have the higher turnover of our intestinal cells actually there is a one compound uh, is produced called the ethanolamine and if the ethanolamine is not ethanolamine metabolizing bacteria are not there then this ethanolamine acts on our intestinal cells and create the more leaky gut in the obesity uh, models what we have seen and create the exactly the same phenomena what we have seen into the older mouse it again this early aging phenomena also comes with the aging and diabetes so that's a that's a, another example is there but not taking much time, I would like to kind of go on to the next question. What we were trying to answer, uh, ask is, uh, can the micro, these microbiome abnormalities coming with the age, along with the leaky gut, can we reverse them? And then if you reverse them, can we have the better uh, healthy aging uh, uh, gut and brain uh, conditions? So we have really, I will try to show you the some of the uh, uh, examples of, we can use the multiple strategies to reverse them. So we can use the drug intervention or the pharmacological interventions. We can also use the probiotics or prebiotics, as well as the another concept is called the postbiotic, which I will talk a little bit about. So to, to talk about the, um, the pharmacological intervention, we have proven that is a, a anti-diabetic drug called the metformin actually creates the very similar beneficial effects what the butyrate does. So what this metformin has the ability to modulate the microbiome, and actually, when we feed the mouse with the metformin, it also induces the goblet, uh, increases the goblet cell numbers in the both ileum as well as in colon, and also increases the butyrate levels in here. You can see here, as well as the another molecule which was uh, also found a uh, low into the uh, older gut, taurine. So taurine was also induced by metformin, and this this cartoon shows that is metformin actually in, uh, changes the microbiome in a way. Uh, to produce the higher level of the butyrate, which increases the more goblet cells, more mucin, that reduces the leaky gut and inflammation, and that promotes the health, healthy aging by decreasing the metabolic dysfunctions as well as the cognitive dysfunctions there too. Based on this data, that's what the MET, METFAP trial, what we are doing in the collaboration of the ATM Health and Wake Forest is in the heart failure patient because as I showed, the heart failure patient also has very similar phenomena what the older people uh, show that. And these are all, also the older people, but that, that pathology is more exacerbated in there too. We are also trying to understand is how this exactly this metformin actually impacts the microbiome as well as the brain health. So we, we so our our uh, one of the postdoc fellows Santos uh, is also working on on this project on board. Then I want I would like to show you the another way to change this microbiome is the probiotics. So we have uh, developed the, some of the probiotics which we have isolated from very young gut, like from the infant diapers, uh, and and put them as a consortia which we call that as a probiotic mini microbiome. So it's a pretty complex consortia of lactobacilli, enterococci, streptococci, bifidobacteria, and other microbes. They are including Clostridia, and we have published this one is. We have done like, like the several studies on the mouse as well as in the human uh, microbiome. It, this consortia can actually change the microbiome 
and uh, in the both in the mouse and humans. And all of these effects are transient and reversible, which is basically uh, qualifies for the FDA and CDC guidelines to be safe and uh, to be transplanting to the humans, uh, as well as it increases the butyrate levels. It increases the many, many beneficial effects, which we, which I don't have time to uh, present there. These my two postdocs, which, uh, um, which were working on this project and both has been transitioned to, uh, uh, to really uh, acquire the, or join the tenure track faculty in the another university. We also look on the another strategy to see if we can promote the butyrate by other uh, non-microbial way. So we have isolated some of the fibers, which we call the prebiotic. Prebiotic fibers are normally food for the good bacteria, which promotes the production of the good metabolites, including the butyrate. So we have isolated one of our very talented student uh, actually did, done this, uh, this project was um, a student from the Iran and right now she's in the postdoc in Canada, uh, took the corn, quinoa, sunflower and pumpkin and sago uh, seeds and isolated these fibers. And when we compare these fibers with the very one standard uh, prebiotic called the inulin, it actually, they, they, they have the very good effect, even the better effect than the inulin uh, by, by increasing these butyrate and propionate and decreasing the gut permeability by increasing the tight junction proteins, uh, as well as changing the gut brain axis to reduce the, uh, to reduce the risk of uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity. So this is, and again, the, another example is we can restore back to the microbiome there too. Now we have these probiotics, prebiotics. We also have optimized this in the form of uh, yogurt, which we call the symbiotic yogurt. We also have tested this yogurt for reducing diabetes progression, anti-aging effect, as well as the cognitive decline effect in the cancer models. Uh, my, uh, uh, my PhD student, Brandy Miller, is working on this one. We are also uh, made almost this ready to go for technology, uh, which we are working on uh, with the uh, licensing uh, to, to the another company called the Must Be LLC, as well as we are also uh, trying to work with the Feeding Tampa Bay to see if we can uh, integrate this uh, drink into their, their meal plans, which they are distributing for the food insecure people because the food with the food insecurity, this microbiome abnormalities also comes in there. So this is the, another example, how we are translating the our science to uh, from plate to the people. This the, another concept, what we have discovered first time was is even if the, we kill the, some of these probiotics, actually they also have the anti-aging effect. And the way they have the anti-aging effect is actually they also promotes uh, the increased goblet cells. And, and because these cells are dead, these bacteria are dead, they have the certain components in their cells or cell wall called the lipoteicoic acid, which promotes uh, this, this uh, goblet cells. And, and, and you can see here the goblet cells uh, are significantly increased and decrease the leaky gut. So I don't want to go into more detail, but, but what we have actually published was is from this dead bacteria, this LTA can uh, act onto the goblet cells to increase the more mucin production. And the more the mucin production will decrease the leaky gut, and that will promote the uh, aging related uh, healthy aging by reducing the aging related conditions there too. And this uh, this uh, technology is already licensed for the post-biotic ink, and that is already started the clinical trial in the UK, as well as uh, also initiating some of the clinical trial, trials in the United States. And, and this is coming in the form of the POSIVIO. So most likely this year it will be in the market in the form of this particular type of uh, component. With that, I hope I have shown you the enough evidence that we can uh, draw a conclusion that is the older microbiome is actually the inducer of the leaky gut and inflammation into the older uh, uh, body. And this is because the older microbiome is not capable of making the butyrate. And that because less butyrate means the less mucin, less mucin uh, means the higher leaky gut. And higher leaky gut means higher inflammation. If this inflammation remains longer, it creates the brain abnormalities as well as the other uh, metabolic abnormalities too. The good news is we can actually reverse these conditions by many ways, including the pharmacological interventions, like including metformin, using the probiotic mini microbiome, prebiotic from a corn or sago, as well as the post biotic, which is a heat killed bacteria there. So that's kind of the, our, as I said, the, our passion is to really move the science from plate to the people. And the take home message here is I would like to give is 
take care of your gut as well as tiny bugs and they can make you live longer healthy and more uh, more soft memory uh, uh, life in the later part of the life uh, with that i would like to so the last part of my uh, talk is we have really uh, developed the uh, very nice collaborations with within the um, usf uh, uh, and and the tampa bay area as well as outside of the uh, tampa bay area too so we kind of have the collaboration with uh, uh, within the usf health uh, as well as the other colleges in the usf including the um, uh, tgs and uh, uh, Moffitt uh, Cancer Center, and and then as you said, saw that the Microbiome and Aging Consortium also has the uh, arms to the other uh, uh, outside institutions too. Some of them are listed in here too. Uh, on the another note, what I would like to say is really we have the very state of art core facilities within the, our center uh, and institute, and uh, these gives uh, focus mainly on the microbiome. Uh, and if anyone has any plan of doing the microbiome, these are really one-stop solution we can provide where we can uh, we can provide the study planning and implementation, which has the one whole uh, one dedicated core in here. We have the whole microbiome biorepository core, which catalogs the samples coming from the all these uh, different multi-sites uh, universities. Um, as well as we can, we have the whole sequencing facility, as well as the bioinformatic capabilities, which we do the microbiome analysis within the uh, our center and, and, and including the sequencing to bioinformatic, as well as we are also uh, setting up the uh, targeted microbial uh, uh, metabolomic core also, so we can also measure the microbiome uh, produced metabolite uh, there. With that, I would like to thank my team members. Uh, very special thanks to Dr. Christian, Christian Bicho, as well as the Harry Von Lavorn and Steve Leggett and, and uh, Charlie Lockwood uh, uh, for providing all, all the support, uh, what I, I could do uh, here. And uh, we are really uh, very thankful for all our participants who are participating in our uh, clinical studies, as well as the collaborators at USF, Wake Forest, HeartSale team, NIA GB team, uh, NIA Diversity Consortium team, along with the, uh, all the funding agencies who are supporting over this uh, innovative program. With that, I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, go ahead and take the mic. Hi, Dr. Yadav, that was a great uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I was wondering if there's any data on any specific uh, genera that are more anti-inflammatory in the gut as opposed to others that might be more pro-inflammatory. Uh, then that's a that's a great question. So uh, definitely there are multiple um, uh, floras which has been known to be um, anti-inflammatory. So for example, some of them has been used as a probiotic, like for example, bifidobacteria, lactobacilli. Uh, this, these are the common names there. Uh, but you, you can also like there is new class of the probiotics are coming is called the uh, Kermensia. Uh, and, and there are some of the butyrate, very classical butyrate producing bacteria, which also has the anti-inflammatory effects. So um, yes, there, there are multiple of them. And uh, they normally are, um, they, they, they love the fibers in our food. So if we eat the more fibers, they will propagate naturally more. Thank you. And also uh, one quick follow up question. Um, sure. Are there any studies ongoing looking at the effects of um, curcumin on these uh, anti inflammatory bacterial flora? Uh, yes, I think so. There are some of the studies which already showed that the curcumin does change to the microbiome. However, this always remains is a uh, question mark is whether the curcumin works first on the immune system and change the microbiome, because if we change the immune system, it will also reflect the changes into the microbiome. Or does the microbiome changes first, and then actually that has the anti-inflammatory effect of the curcumin. However, there is a one study actually uh, uh, 
uh, I'm not sure whether that is still published or not, but um, uh, into the UN C Chapel Hill, um, they have done is like when they incubate the curcumin with the microbiome, microbiome actually changes this curcumin for more functional molecules. So other curcuminoids, which are produced by the microbiome fermentation, actually they becomes more effective to have these anti-inflammatory effects. Whereas if you give just the curcumin, although curcumin itself has the anti-inflammatory effect, but the potency is not as much as when it is given uh, after uh, microbiome fermentation. So that's kind of the, another example is where the microbiome can also contribute to increase the efficacy of certain interventions what we give. But opposite side is actually microbiome can also degrade many active drugs to make it inactive drugs too. So it depends on who has the what kind of microbiome and it can interfere with the both ways. It can increase the efficacy of certain treatments or the drugs, but on the same time, it can also reduce actually the certain uh, certain um, drugs efficacy too. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein? Yeah, uh, it's a similar type of question. What is the impact of, of exercise and sleep on microbiome and, and what's that inter interaction? Uh, similar to the curcumin question. That's a, that's a great question. So um, when we talk about the sleep and the exercise, they both are the lifestyle uh, kind of factors there, right? There is a, um, there are few studies are done actually, the people uh, who does very exhaustive exercise, in, for example, in, in the athletes, they actually develop the leaky gut. And they develop the different kind of microbiome signatures. And you do the mild uh, exercise, that actually decreases the leaky gut. So exact mechanisms are still not now. How exactly how the exercise impact the uh, leaky gut, what really it does, because mostly the muscles uh, are the one which are working when we are doing the exercise, but how does the gut is actually impacted with that? But there are clear cut evidence so is that is if there is a um, mild exercise is done and the regular exercise is done, uh, those people have the less leaky gut um, and have the better microbiome or different microbiome, which is the uh, which which means is it has a little bit more uh, anti-inflammatory microbial uh, composition as compared to the people uh, who doesn't do the exercise. Does that answer to your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, how about the sleep part of that? Um, that's that's really a good question. So sleep, uh, it's known that the actually some of the stress hormones that change the microbiome. So uh, it's not just only the one one way uh, road here. The, it's not just the only the uh, microbiome or gut actually impacts the brain, but the brain also impacts to the uh, gut uh, too. So when there is a less sleep or there is a more stress, actually these all the stress hormones as well as the stress uh, related chemokines also infiltrate into the in intestinal nervous system too. And that actually also induces the abnormalities into the gut also. So, th so there is a cycle so is that is if, if you just sleep is the one type of stress, but even if you stress the mouse or anyone else, you see dramatic changes into the microbiome happens, which is linked with this kind of the stress. Thank you, great answer to my question. We'll take one more, Dr. Dasso. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Sure. Great, uh, great talk, uh, Harry. Um, <clears throat> my question concerns the the balance of, of fibers and that, I mean, you're probably familiar with the paper that was published where mice fed a high inulin diet to predispose them to liver cancer. Um, but the point I want to make is that um, there's also benefit in insoluble fiber. Um, there was a paper recently published showing that in a mouse model of lupus um, that the mice fed, in this case was cellulose, um, it helped protect them against the autoimmunity in this mouse model. And there's been other studies too showing the benefits of soluble fiber. So I know diet is very complex. So I was wondering if that's something you've considered in terms of the, 
the whole balance between mm -hmm. soluble and insoluble fiber. Mm -hmm. So what is your question? I'm so sorry, my, my question, you. have you considered also insoluble fiber and its beneficial roles in addition to the fermentable fiber that increases the, the butyrate in that? Because my, my, my point is insoluble fiber is also shown to have value. Oh yeah, so no, that, that's really a great question. So when we talk about, let's say, when we were talking about the prebiotics, right? Prebiotics mm -hmm. are the soluble fibers, but they are non-digestible by the human. But they are fermentable by the microbiome. So for that reason, it's a different category. Now, when we talk about the insoluble fibers, uh, although the many of the microbes are, uh, microbes when I talk about the bacteria, are not actually able to degrade them. However, when we talk about the overall microbiome, sometimes we kind of get away with the impression is everything is bacteria. No, that's not true. Actually, the microbiome means there is, there is a fungi, there are viruses, there is archaea, other, other microbes are also living. So the fungi is a good example. Actually, they, they love the insoluble fibers and they can degrade those fibers and half metabolize, then the bacteria can pick up there or the, these fungi can produce a certain metabolites which bacteria can use them as a uh, as a substrate and they or as a food and then they will produce further metabolites so that way yes it, the insoluble fibers can also change the microbiome and can have the beneficial effect but depends on the which fiber we are talking mm -hmm. yeah. thank you All right, it looks like that's it. Thank you so much. Um, I will have the recording up later this afternoon um, for anyone who'd like to rewatch. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Highly appreciate everyone to join in. Great, bye-bye. Thank you. Mm, bye.